Good afternoon. Thank you for watching this virtual lecture event hosted by the Institute of World Politics. For those of you who are new, IWP is a graduate school of national security and international affairs. We have five master's degree programs, 18 certificates of study, and a new doctoral program. We also offer the opportunity to take a single course without having to pay an entire semester's worth of tuition costs. One can also audit such a course at a much less cost. If you're interested in learning more about us, please visit iwp.edu. This evening, we'll be hearing from Dr. Kevin Real. Dr. Real is an associate professor at the National Intelligence University. He has spent over 28 years in the U.S. government as a counterintelligence analyst studying foreign intelligence services. He received a PhD in war studies from King's College London, an MS in strategic intelligence from the Joint Military Intelligence College, and a BA in Russian and political science from Brig Brigham Young University. He has written on a variety of intelligence and counterintelligence topics, focusing on the history of Soviet Eastern Bloc intelligence services. Dr. Rural, welcome, and thank you for being with us today. Well, thank you very much. And thanks, especially, thanks to the Institute of World Politics for inviting me. Thanks especially to Aaron Dennis for connecting me with IWP. Um, Aaron is the man with the connections, so I, I do appreciate his work in, in, um, in making this possible. Um, today, I'm going to talk about my recent book, the title you see on the screen, Russian Defectors, Revelations of Renegade Intelligence Officers, 1924 to 1954. And I'm going to start initially with just a kind of a basic discussion of the research that went into it and how I approached the question. And then I will introduce you to some of the individuals who I uh, examined during the course of this study. And then try to end up with some answer to the research question I began with. I would start though with a caveat that this, the views that I'll be expressing are my own and not the policy of the Department of Defense of the US government, any, any US government agency. So what you'll hear is not US government policy. Hopefully that doesn't affect your view of it. Um, so I'm gonna start today by just discussing how this research pro this research uh, got started. The basis of this research was a question. What can we learn about the national security planning of a closed political system by analyzing the aggregated information that comes from intelligence officer defectors? Information from defectors, especially intelligence officers, has historically been used for counterintelligence requirements. Who are the spies in our midst? What methods was an intelligence service employing? Who and where are intelligence officers and facilities? My research took that a little differently. And my research was intended to look beyond counterintelligence, counterespionage, to see what window these individuals can open into the inner thinking of a closed system. I used two big different uh, um, repositories of information or types of information in the process of this assessment. One was direct information, or information that came directly from the defector, him or herself, the, the documents they brought with them, and, and the things they wrote or said after their defection. One of the advantages of researching an older set of subjects, as I did with this particular study, was that many of their debriefings that were done by intelligence services were available in declassified archives in a variety of countries and languages. Probably the most interesting, came from the German Gestapo briefings of several individuals who defected to Germany during World War II and whose debriefings were later captured by US forces at the end of World War II and deposited in the US National Archives. This also made it possible on a few occasions to compare debriefings of the same defector by different country services. These provided rich insights into the information that the person could, have, could offer. The second type of information was indirect which came from the circumstances surrounding the defectors, such as when and where they occurred. The timing of the defection was an important factor in understanding the thinking inside the Soviet Union at the time. Additionally, the country to which defectors chose to defect changed over time, giving an evolving image of what countries or organizations defectors felt would receive them safely or and would use their information securely and appropriately. All of this information aggregated together 
reveals something about Soviet national security thinking and threat perceptions. So the next question is why did I choose intelligence officers specifically? There were a lot of defectors during the Soviet era. In 1929, Stalin began to recognize that defectors or non-returnees, as the Soviet government called people who refused to return from abroad, were both an embarrassment and a national security threat. Initial steps were taken in 1929 to stem the flow with additional measures in 1934 that equated leaving the country or refusing to return with treason. Nevertheless, many people from all backgrounds defected, including government officials, military members, diplomats, journalists, sportsmen, dancers, merchant marines, and of course, intelligence officers. Intelligence officers were different from the rest for a few reasons. First, they had elite access to information that most people did not have. They were vetted national security professionals who enjoyed privileged access to housing, food, and often international travel that the typical Soviet citizen could not even dream of. Consequently, there were good sources of information about how the Soviet Union viewed the world, especially about where the Soviet Union perceived threats. So for this study, I examined 89 officers across the years 1924 to 1954. They included 85 men and four women. The time frame somewhat chose itself. The first recorded Soviet intelligence officer defector was Pyotr Karpov, who defected in Germany in 1924. The end point came after a cluster of officers defected soon after Stalin's death and Lavrenti Beria's execution in 1953 and ran then into 1954. The choice of subjects was scoped by the phrase Soviet intelligence officer and defector. So first, I chose only individuals who worked for a Soviet intelligence or state security service, both civilian and military. This excluded some prominent defectors from other Eastern Bloc countries during the same time. Just incidentally, I published a separate paper last year that discussed defectors from Eastern Bloc, the, the Eastern Bloc overall in the first two decades after World War II, but this book covers only Soviets. Secondly, I chose staff intelligence and state security officers, not co-optees or agents. Staff officers had a different relationship with information, more firsthand information. And so they were more, uh, they were better sources of that insider thinking. And third, I chose those who physically defected and offered themselves to another country, which excluded individuals who remained in place as agents. In intelligence literature, the phrase defector in place is sometimes used to describe someone recruited as a penetration agent who remains in their place of work. I did not include anyone who fell into that category, in part because if they're a defector, they're actually no longer in place, and so the phrase defector in place is an oxymoron. A decision to defect is different from a decision to become a penetration agent. It was usually a more wrenching choice to break permanently from a home country, knowing that by doing so, there would be no going back without consequences. And that the consequences would affect not just the individual, but the individual's family, whether they returned or not. Consequences on the family were often what prevented penetration agents from defecting. And defectors faced the possibility that their family members left inside the Soviet Union would be put in prison or lose all their worldly possessions. That made defection a hard choice, which was obviously the reason the Soviets, Soviet Union put those rules in place in the first place. I did, however, include people who defected, but who later decided to go back to the Soviet Union. Over the course of the Soviet history, there were a few of those, but that almost always led to disaster for the defector. But, um, but because they did make the decision to defect, in the first place, I included them. I also included some who offered to defect, but whom the Soviet state security system caught before they could culminate their decision. Again, they made the choice, even if they were unsuccessful. So the list of 89 individuals 
divided naturally into five chronologic groupings based on both the world situation at the time and the circumstances inside the Soviet Union. In the next few slides, I'll introduce some of the people who fall into these groupings, but I should first explain the longest period in Soviet history without any intelligence officer defectors at all. That's from 1931 to 1936. In fact, actually, that is the longest period in the entire, uh, not just during the, uh, the time of my book, but even up until the end of the Soviet Union, and it appears even since the Soviet Union, as there have been, continue, they have continued to be defectors from Russia um, sub, uh, in the post-Soviet era. As I mentioned earlier, Stalin noticed in 1929 that the numbers of defectors and non-returnees were increasing throughout the 1920s. Climaxing in 1929, when over 70 Soviet officials refer, re refused to return home from abroad. In his typical blunt way, Stalin demanded that the problem be stopped. That led to an eventual decrease based upon new rules that governed the lives of Soviet officials abroad. But the slowdown did not come in, uh, um, immediately, and it actually didn't start coming until after 1930, which could be called the first year of the defector for the Soviet Union. Um, five OGPU, or civilian officers, and Razveduper, or military intelligence officers, defected in that year alone. And several other defectors who had previously defected became prominent when they published their revelations during that year. It was a particularly bad year for Soviet, the Soviet Union in relation to defectors. But the, the measures did have an effect, and it took another even stronger catalyst, stronger than the fear that defection, that those rules put in place for defection, for the next group of officers to defect. So now I'm gonna just introduce you to those groups, to the people in those groups. I, I'm gonna show you some photographs and I'll tell you now that I don't, that photographs of all of these 89 are not available. I'll discuss that a little bit as I go along, but you'll see just if, in some cases, only a few photographs. And this is just to give you an idea of who some of these people are. The first group uh, included defectors and de intelligence and state security officers who defected from 1924 to 1930. Many of the defectors in this first group began their careers as enthusiastic Bolshevik adherents. Um, Nisterovich and Zivotovsky, for example, in the top right and left, were senior Bolshevik officials. Arutyunov, who was on the uh, in, um, in the bottom, uh, no, sorry, middle right, and others who are not pictured, like Dumbadze, were young when the Bolshevik Revolution occurred and fully supported it at first. Drugov, who's on the bottom left of this chart, was a socialist revolutionary, not a Bolshevik, but he was included as a member of the first Cheka Presidium, or the first state security organizational presidium. Each of the 16 officials in this group eventually lost their faith in the system. And even more so, they lost their faith in the people around them. Others in this group were not convinced Bolsheviks, but cooperated out of, out of a sense of personal survival. Sobolev, who you see on this chart on the bottom right, for example, was a czarist era naval officer who threw his loyalty to the Bolsheviks, although he was always quick to point out that he never joined the party. He was sent abroad as an expert to serve as a naval attache in Turkey and then in Sweden, and he decided to defect while he was in Sweden. It wasn't unusual during the early Soviet days, particularly in the military, for the, Soviet, for the Soviet Union to use non-Bolsheviks who had some expertise. But that was a, a, a risky thing to do because some of those ended up becoming disenchanted. Several individuals in this group complained about the low moral standard of the early Bolsheviks, their lust for blood, and their intolerance for anyone not fully in agreement with them. This was often the articulated reason for defection during this time. The second group included the first defectors to violate the new rules regarding defection and included individuals who defected between 1937 and 1940. For them, it took an even greater threat. 
um, to convince them to defect. That was the Great Purge, or what came to be known as the Yezhovshina, which was named after Nikolai Yezhov, People's Commissar for Internal Affairs from 1936 to 1938, at the height of the purge. Most of the eight officers in this group joined a Soviet intelligence or state security officer at about the same time as the defectors in the previous group. But these officers persevered through the 30s, most of the 30s, sometimes per participating in the very actions that led earlier officers to defect. These left because they saw their own colleagues being arrested and executed, and they saw themselves being next. So they left to save their own skins. Several of these officers were among the elite in the Soviet intelligence system, known as illegals. They were the most trusted of officers, operating ab abroad under non-Soviet identities with no visible connection to the Soviet Union. But when they defected, they potentially brought information about highly sensitive source networks with them. However, their disagreement was not with the Soviet Union per se in some cases, but with Stalin, whom they saw as a traitor to the purest Marxist-Leninist principles that they fought for their whole careers. In some cases, such as Feldman on the lower right, who's better known as Alexander Arlov, or Paretsky on the uh, left middle, who's better known as Ignaz Reis, they offered partial or no information as suspicious of the Western powers as they were of Stalin. Others like Ginsberg, Volodarsky, who are illegals, and Graf, who was an embassy-based military intelligence officer, eventually opened up and provided significant information about Soviet decision-making. Either way, the timing of and reasons for their defections were significant. The next group of defectors broke with the Soviet system during World War II and immediately afterward. In the months after the initiation of Operation Barbarossa, which began on the 22nd of June, 1941, German forces penetrated deep into Soviet territory. It's likely that thousands of Soviet intelligence state security personnel fell into German captivity during that time. The first Soviet personnel exposed to the German onslaught were NKVD border guards and internal security troops who were um, an, unknown of, an unknown number of whom were captured, and some offered their services to their captors. Defection requires access to a foreign power, to which an aspiring defector can offer him or herself. Before World War II broke out, tight control over the Soviet population and severe limitations on interactions with foreigners meant that a defector had to make a conscious decision to approach a foreign power, either while posted outside the Soviet Union or by walking across an international border into a neighboring country. That changed when German forces invaded the Soviet Union and millions of Soviet personnel were suddenly exposed to foreigners, not by their own choice, but by a foreign power coming to them. Of the 32 officers I examined in this group, 18 were captured on the battlefield between 1941 and 1943, most of which defected once they were already in captivity, either to the German army or to dissident Soviet forces, mostly under the command of the defected Soviet Major General Andrei Vlasov. A few others were already abroad under diplomatic cover, including the, th the three of them on this chart, Akhmedov, Uzenka, and an officer using the pseudonym Volkov, who are in the, all three on the bottom right of this chart. Akhmedov was an unusual case. Among all the defectors in this study, he was the only one raised as a Muslim. He was a military intelligence officer dispatched to the Soviet embassy in Berlin just a few months before Operation Barbarossa. And he was there when the German government severed diplomatic relations with the Soviet Union and interned all Soviet diplomats. Akhmedov was traded, along with other Soviet diplomats, at the neutral Turkish border. However, rather than returning to the Soviet Union, he remained in Turkey as an intelligence officer. He approached the U.S. consulate in Istanbul just after Pearl Harbor, the Pearl Harbor attack, and offered his services. However, the man he met at the U.S. consulate turned him away. The United States and the Soviet Union were allies at that particular time, so the United States could not accept Soviet defectors. A short time later, Ahmedov approached a British representative in Turkey 
who gave a similar answer. Finally, he approached the Turkish government, which accepted him. Ahmedov chose a bad time to try to defect, although his attempts did indicate the concerns that other intelligence officers were experiencing at the same time. This group, you'll, you may notice, extends beyond the formal end of World War II because the environment for defectors did not immediately change. Several of the defectors in this group, after having spent time in German, German POW camps, fell into U.S. control after the defeat of Germany. However, the post-war U.S. policy was driven by the Yalta Agreement, um, which included a stipulation that each ally repatriate POWs to their home country. Two individuals on this slide is Solnov, who's on the bottom right, and Lapin on the top, I'm sorry, bottom left, and Lapin on the bottom on the top right, were repatriated to the Soviet Union soon after the end of hostilities, even though they were NKVD officers and potentially had valuable information. Bisonov was executed soon after he returned, and Lapin spent a lengthy time in a Soviet corrective labor camp. The photo you see on the slide on the upper right is actually his, his uh, prison photo. It took over a year after the war ended for the Western allies to begin to accept Soviet defectors, then only tentatively initially. The next group included the first Soviet intelligence officers and state, and state security officers whom the Western allies accepted after that policy began to change. Although this group includes 22 officers, only two photos are available. And this lack of information reflects the tentative Western handling of Soviet defectors in the early post-war period. This lack of easily accessible information about defectors during this period has led some authors to assess that there were none at all. However, Great Britain and the United States did begin to accept Soviet officers, and the number grew through the, through the late 1940s. Germany and Austria, where the Western allies' occupation zones bordered directly on Soviet occupation zones, were the most prominent locations for defections. And most of the defectors in this group crossed one of, those one of those borders. Most were handled quietly by their Western um, uh, intelligence organizations that, that accepted them. And some were settled in out of the way places like Venezuela or Chile and told to restart their life there. Shola Putin, who is pictured on the side on the left was an exception among these because he eventually became a BBC Russian service presenter and then a Radio Liberty presenter. However, most disappeared into obscurity and little is known about their lives after their defection. Only three of the officers in this group, unlike other groups, made public statements or published their stories. And then all three of those used pseudonyms when they published. Incidentally, although I don't cover it in this book, the peri this period also saw a wave of intelligence and state security defectors from other non-Soviet Eastern Bloc countries, especially Poland and Czechoslovakia, just as those countries were falling into the Soviet orbit. These other early defectors are also relatively unknown. The flow of defectors waned in the early 1950s, as the Soviet Union began to enforce rules again against defection similar to what happened in 1930. This prompted the United States to develop new programs like what was called REDCAP to, inter to induce defection, especially of individuals with elite information access like intelligence officers. But the death of Stalin in 1953, and equally importantly, the arrest and execution of Soviet State Security Director Lavrenti Beria later that year, prompted a brief new wave of defections. 10 officers in a 13 month period, who did not need outside inducement to, to um, per persuade them to defect. They defected for similar reasons as their predecessors in the Yezhovshina period in the late 1930s, out of fear that they were in danger from a purge. While well, with Beria's downfall came the inevitable purge that followed the arrest of, state security, of a state security leader during the Stalin era. Any officer who had connected his or her career with Beria's was at risk of going down with him. Several of the officers in this group talked about the chaos that followed Beria's December 1953 execution, and one, Sharokhov, who you see in the bottom middle of this slide, 
who is better known as, known as Vladimir Petrov, was even accused by his detractors of attempting to establish a Beria plot in the embassy in Canberra, Australia, where he was serving. Like in other periods, several of the officers in this group were illegals, and they represented the post-war Soviet emphasis on re-establishing the illegals program. Brik, Chaklov, and Lindstrom, who you see on this chart, um, among, along with one other officer from this group whose name and photograph are not available, were all recruited as illegals in the late 1940s and early 1950s, usually because they had linguist skills that the Soviet intelligence service valued. Chaklov, for example, could speak German well enough to pass as a German. Brik spent part of his adolescence in the United States and had a convincing American accent. Lindstrom was of Swedish descent, living in Estonia, and could fit easily into Scandinavia. The illegals program continued throughout the Soviet era and into the post-Soviet era, as evidenced by the compromise of illegals in the United States, Spain, and Germany in 2010 and 2011. Among these photos is the only one available of a female intelligence officer defector, Evgenia Kartseva on the bottom middle with her husband, but who's better known by her operational pseudonym, Evgenia Petrova. Three other women were among the 89 officers in this study, one during World War II and two um, during the early Cold War period. But they are among the lesser known defectors and no photos of them are available. So, what did we learn? Start off with the question of what can we learn from this, this the aggregated information of these defectors. So what did we learn? By examining 89 people across 30 years. Um, these officers cover mostly Stalin's reign, so most of the lessons apply to that period directly. However, some may be extrapolated to other periods as well, including possibly to today. First, the motivations of defectors changed based on the circumstances around them. Sometimes motivations were directly related to the missions that defectors were tasked to perform or the people they associated with and their disagreement with those missions and the people. Sometimes defection was caused by the unstable situation inside the Soviet Union, especially during purges or after policy changes. Foreign intelligence services have studied defector motivations, often with the goal of appealing to those motivations to induce more defections. The first documented study of, a Soviet, of, of Soviet intelligence state security officers, defectors, was done in 1948 at the request of the Joint Intelligence Committee in the UK. It examined 20 defectors over the previous 20 years and compared, among other things, their motivations. The CIA studied defector motivations during the Cold War, with some CIA officers concluding that personal problems like relationship issues or the, um, the um, uh, catalyst of a, of, a, of a woman in particular, for, for some of these who crossed the boundary into Germany, or problems with a boss, rather than ideology, were the primary motivation for defection. But the choice to defect is different from the choice to become a spy. It's more final. It involves a complete break with the home country. It took more than just personal problems to make such a wrenching decision. And dissatisfaction with the Soviet system often accompanied personal problems in that decision. Another lesson regards the fluctuating vetting standards for personnel in the Soviet system assigned to sensitive national security positions. When the Soviet Union was stable, it had the luxury of enforcing strict standards and excluded anyone from a sensitive position who had any taint of an anti-Soviet past, either in their own lives or in the lives of any of their family members. On the other hand, several of the defectors examined were recruited during times of high tension in the Soviet Union, such as during the Great Purge or during World War II, when the Soviet Union needed a lot of people fast. They were not vetted as thoroughly, leading some people being leading to some people being brought into sensitive positions whose family members or themselves had been arrested as kulaks or as enemies of the people or who supported Germany during the war. This was particularly true of people with foreign language capabilities. After World War II, as Soviet forces occupied Eastern European countries, they needed linguists to assist with investigations, interrogations, 
and liaison responsibilities. But linguists were some of the most vulnerable of employees, and some were brought into their positions without thorough vetting. And consequently, they were heavily represented among the defectors in this study. Finally, Soviet perception of threat evolved over the 30 years examined in the study. The phrase main enemy was coined in after World War II, so it didn't impact the time before or during the war. However, there were still priority targets for Soviet intelligence and state security activities, which reflected the, the threat perceptions of Soviet leaders. Early in the Soviet era, Great Britain filled that position. After 1933, when the Nazi party took control of the German government, Germany took a place alongside Great Britain. Although Stalin never abandoned hope for an accommodation with Hitler, which he achieved with the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact in 1939. In the words of one defector, Leon Helfand, Stalin had been nibbling for an agreement with Hitler since 1933. That changed on 22 June 1941, when Germany invaded the Soviet Union. And the main enemy, although that, that label wasn't existing yet, naturally shifted to Germany. However, even before Germany was defeated, Soviet intelligence began targeting its wartime allies, especially intel establishing intelligence resident tours in places like Canada and Australia, even while maintaining intelligence liaison with the Americans and the British. Several defectors discussed independently the belief among Soviet, Soviet leaders that the next war would, uh, would follow soon after Germany's defeat and would be against Great Britain and the United States. This was in contrast to the messages that US forces were receiving at the end of the war, and that, that the Soviet Union was an ally. Um, a pamphlet that was distributed amongst US military forces in Germany, just as the, just near the end of the war, as the, uh, as the US forces were moving eastward and the Soviet forces were moving westward, and they were soon to meet each other on the board, on that, uh, that, uh, that line that ran through Germany, Austria, and into Czechoslovakia. That pamphlet was titled, Our Red Army Ally, and it introduced an American audience to the Soviet military, whom, with whom most had had little uh, direct interactions. That was the US experience, but great, um, but, um, the Soviet experience was to tell their forces that the Americans and British were the next enemy. Soon after, um, uh, soon after the war, the Soviet system initially returned to the pre-war main enemy, Great Britain. And that was the primary threat, and that was what, they were, what the Soviet system was used to. But Great Britain was soon joined by the United States in what the Soviets called the Anglo-American Anti-Soviet Alliance. By the late 1940s, when it was clear that, the, that Great Britain was defeated economically and was losing its empire, while the United States was assuming the role of the leader of the democratic world, the label main enemy was coined and applied to the United States, which stuck for the rest of the Soviet era and could be said to remain there today. That's my presentation, and I invite your questions. All right, thank you, Dr. Real. Um, now, now we'll transition to Q&A. So if you have any questions, please feel free to comment in the Q&A section on the bottom of the screen. Um, so we take a look. Do you have a question here? Um, were any of these defectors direct participants in the assassination of Leon Trotsky? And if so, did they provide key information on the assassination mission? Um, none were direct participants, no. However, several of them knew something, knew some of the people who were involved. So as the, the investigation proceeded, they were able to provide some information that supported that investigation. Um, particularly amongst them were some of the illegals that were in Europe um, in the, uh, uh, the 1930s, people like um, uh, uh, Krivitsky, or as he was known, um, Ginsberg, by his real, by his original name, he did provide some information about some of the individuals who were involved in that assassination. 
They were, however, um, familiar with the process through which the Soviet Union sent illegals abroad and the individuals who were involved in the assassination of, assassination of Trotsky were illegals and they were dispatched abroad um, under the, those, those uh, non-Soviet identities. Um, the individual who eventually did um, uh, was the perpetrator of Trotsky's assassination, actually had received his passport. His passport was a Canadian passport. And he got that from um, a, from the, uh, the, um, the, the, the during the, the, uh, the Spanish Civil War, when foreigners traveled to Spain to participate uh, in the Spanish Civil War in the, the, uh, uh, the uh, international brigades, when they would arrive, the Soviets would take their passports and say, we'll keep these safely for you. And then when they, it was time for those, those foreigners to go home, often they were told, oh, we've lost your passport. Just go and um, apply for a new one when you get home. The passport that was used by the illegal who did participate in the assassination of Trotsky um, was one of those passports harvested during the Spanish Civil War. And that is something that uh, Kravitsky was able to talk about and to a lesser extent, Fedbin or Gawov as well. So they provided s information surrounding that, um, although they were not, none of them were directly involved in it. Did the Soviet Union try to contact or to kill any of these defectors once their defection became known? What did the host government of the defectors do to protect them? Um, several of the individuals in this group, uh, their identity, or in this study, their identities came from a book. The book was a KGB all points bulletin book, essentially. It was published in 1969. The book was brought to the West by another defector later than any of the ones I'm talking about here, an individual who defected, an Armenian KGB officer who defected in 1972. But he brought that book with him, and it basically identified over about 600 individuals who had either defected abroad or who had returned, who had failed to return from abroad, whom KGB offices around the world were told to be on the lookout for. Um, the purpose for that book was to persuade, to, to get the KGB off, the offices, the resident tourists, to do one of three things. One was to approach them to re-recruit re them, sometimes to, to get them to, to, uh, to persuade them, often to, uh, with, with the use of coercion, to work for the Soviet Union again. Um, the second reason was to persuade them, sometimes by coercion, sometimes by, with the help of family members back in the Soviet Union, to come back to the Soviet Union to face justice. The third and last resort reason was to target them for assassination. Um, assassination was an unusual event during the Soviet era. Um, one of the individuals who did defect was himself an assassin. And that was Yevgeny Kakhlov, who defected in 1954. He was sent abroad to assassinate a, a, a Ukrainian nationalist leader in Germany. Um, instead of conducting his mission, however, he knocked on the door of that individual and said, I'm a Soviet KGB, a Soviet, in that case, uh, it was called MVD officer. I am here to assassinate you, but I don't want to do that. So I want to request your, your uh, safety instead. When he defected, he brought with him a, a lot of information about how the Soviet Union conducted assassinations abroad. And his defection was extremely embarrassing. And it, and it caused a great deal of, of angst amongst the Soviet state security leadership about, about um, assassinating individuals abroad. So there was a period of time when the Soviets were very hands off on, those, on that sort of an operation. There, have, how, there were, however, others who, did, uh, who were targeted subsequent to this. And another assassin um, named um, uh, Stashinsky defected after the, the period of my study in the 1960s. 
he also brought with him material. In fact, he had succeeded in assassinating some some um, Soviet and some anti-Soviet dissidents in Germany prior to his own defection, and he was actually in jail. He was prosecuted for murder in Germany and spent about four years in jail when he after he defected. But the targets of assassination were very selected. And there were really usually just a couple of reasons why someone might be targeted for assassination. They might be particularly vocal, or they might be particularly embarrassing. But being particularly vocal could sometimes actually be a, a, an, an insulation against assassination. Because if you're publishing books, then you are making um, public statements and appearing on news news uh, 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 interviews or appearing before U.S. Congress for for uh, um, congressional hearings, assassinating you is actually probably a bad idea because it would be very noticed, and it, it it's not something that even a covert act uh, covert act uh, operator can hide. Incidentally, Khachlov was the target of an assassination attempt himself. Um, a few years after he uh, defected, I believe it was in the 1957 or 58, although I'm not actually positive on that year. Um, he, he had married another, he married a Russian woman who lived in the, in the United States so after he defected. And they were, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm mixing names up. The, the, this individual I'm talking about is named Mondic, an individual named Mondic. But Khachlov himself, was also a target of assassination himself using a, um, a radioactive chemical, not unlike what was used in, the night, in 2006 against Alexander Litvinenko in the UK. So yes, there were some who were targeted for assassinations, but the Soviet Union had to be very careful about pulling that trigger, um, figuratively speaking, because it could cause more backlash than it was actually beneficial. So hopefully that answered your question. That was great. That was very interesting. Thanks. Um, the next question here, did these defectors work long term for the U.S. government, such as Voice of America, or did they get witness protection and disappear into the American citizenry? That depended on the time of when they defected and U.S. policy at the time. before. World War II, most defectors did not come to the United States. Most defectors went to France, which was where the Russian emigre anti-Soviet di um, uh, dissidents existed, where they were living. So many defectors initially went to France. So they had very little connection to the United States initially. Um, um, later in the 1930s, several of the Yuzhoshin era defectors did end up in the United States. But in 1941, one of those defectors ended up dead, Walter Kavitsky, um, and it's still debate today as to how he died. It was either suicide or what it was induced suicide. Um, it's not quite clear. Um, so his, his death in 1941 caused um, defectors who came to the, to the United States initially to be very careful and to basically be put under, as you described, witness protection. A couple of the defectors in this group, in the uh, uh, post, the the, um, the even the uh, the um, Yuzhoshin era group did come to the United States, but they were very quiet when they came to the United States, and they basically did disappear into um, uh, uh, new identities. In the post-Soviet era, as I mentioned during the presentation, many of those just disappeared, and we know very little about where they went afterwards. Um, they sometimes they were resettled along with the kind of the mass refugee flows that were uh, moving in Europe at the, in the early post-war era, post-war years. And they ended up in various places, uh, like I mentioned, Venezuela, Chile, some uh, to Brazil, some to Australia. And they usually changed their names and started new lives. In the, um, the last period, Several of them continued to be very prominent in the uh, uh, post-Stalin death period. Um, they wrote books. Um, they published magazine articles. They presented. They they um, 
uh, appeared before congressional appear, uh, hearings, and they were much more public. And to a great extent, that publicity was because that was the policy of the United States at the time and Great Britain, although most of them came to the United States. Um, they, the policy was by 1952-53 time period that we were really not too concerned about whether the Soviet Union thought we were allies any longer. There was little question that there was an alliance there. So um, we encouraged defectors to write their books, to appear publicly, and under their real names in many cases. And they were less likely to be targeted um, or to, to be um, to targeted for some danger, although even some of them did change their names and were settled in the United States under false names. So it was a mix. It just depended upon what the policy toward the Soviet Union was at the time. As I mentioned uh, during, during the presentation, Ahmedov in 1942, he is actually turned away. The United States wouldn't even take him. Um, that changed dramatically over just a few years later. So um, it was an up and down history of how they were received and, and what, da what uh, danger they posed once they came to the United States. Is there anything here in this history for the FBI running Russian CI and defector operations today? I think a couple of things, yes. Um, one is that that idea of the, the motivations changing over time, um, that during those periods of upheaval in the Soviet Union, there was more likely to be defections. And I can say that in a similar period of upheaval in Russia, post-Soviet Russia, there were a number of defections. In the early, in the early to mid 19, 1990s, there were a number of Soviet intelligence officers or, uh, or post-Soviet Russian intelligence officers who defected. Uh, a number of them wrote their books, but a number of them are very quiet today. Clearly, the events that occurred in Salisbury, England in 2000, March 2018 where a post-Soviet, post-Russian uh, intelligence officer was targeted for assassination, um, caused many of those defectors today to take their lives or, or their positions much more seriously. And the FBI, if if, if they were to have any any um, to learn anything from that, and not just the FBI but other U.S. government organizations, if they were to learn from that, it would be that the Putin government is going to look probably more like the Stalin government uh, than the post-Stalin government when it comes to targeting people abroad. And that the th there could be some threats to those individuals that it appeared for a number of years it may not have been there. So they should consider those individuals at risk. And the, I didn't talk about this in the presentation, but the most intense period of defections in the entire Soviet history was between 1989 and 1991, when dozens of Soviet intelligence and state security officers defected. And most of those are not publicly known today. Most of those are have disappeared into a new life. And so um, many of them, some of them might be um, supporting uh, continuing to support U.S. intelligence community, but that would not be something that's being discussed publicly, and I wouldn't necessarily have access to that. So um, there are a number, uh, I think well, part of the question was, did, how, how long did they uh, um, provide support to the U.S. intelligence community after their defections? With some of them, it was decades. Mahmedov, once he was finally accepted in 1947 by the, by the Americans, um, he became a contractor with the uh, U.S. government, and he worked for uh, up into the 1990s uh, in support of the U.S. Intelligence Committee. He died um, in the 1990s. Um, others like Pyotr Diryabin, who defected in 1954, was also a contractor with the U.S. government for a number of years. So some of them um, did directly support U.S. intelligence efforts for, for uh, a number of years. In other words, another person was on the, the World War II era chart named um, uh, Artemyev, um, Vyacheslav Artemyev also worked for the U.S. Army um, intelligence for a number of years until he died probably in the 1970s. So 
um, yes, the, among them there were there were many who did support U.S. intelligence. Uh, as I mentioned, some of them were less enthusiastic about that. Some of them did um, have some ideological biases that made them more difficult, particularly before World War II. Um, but um, as the Cold War came into uh, came into existence, um, more of them did see their new fate as being with the United States or in fewer cases with Great Britain. One more question here. Um, this question kind of goes back to what we were talking before we kind of went live here, but um, an attendee is curious why you chose to end your research at 1954 and not pursue it through the end of the Soviet Union. That's a very good question. I, be I began this research with the plan to go throughout the whole Soviet Union. Um, it quickly became apparent that for two reasons that was unfeasible at the time. One was there's just too much information. There is so much information about these individuals available from declassified um, archives from across the world, not just the United States, but Great Britain, Canada, Australia, Sweden, Finland, Norway, Germany, France, um, Latvia. And all of those, that information was available in discussing these defectors. So I stopped at that point, par point partially because of just the volume of information. Another reason I stopped is because the later you go in history, the less information there is available publicly. Um, and the, the more you need to rely on uh, newspaper reporting or or less authoritative sources than de declassified intelligence de de debriefings and those sorts of things. So 1954 was a good place to stop because that was where that uh, a lot of that archival material started to dry up. However, as, as uh, she's mentioned, um, I am in the process now of doing that second half, basically the second volume, where I, I am looking at uh, another probably close to 80 or so officers that are publicly known post-1954, even into the post-Soviet era, where there have been probably a good dozen, uh, at least that have been publicly known, several of which have written books and have been publicly quite prominent. Um, so I am in the process of doing that research for the second half, which, if I'm lucky, will be published, published as a book, but I can't guarantee that at this point. So look for a second volume sometime in the next few years. All right. Um, well, I believe that's all the time we have this evening. I apologize if we did not get to your question, um, but I would like to thank Dr. Real for joining us this evening and all of you who tuned in here on Zoom and Facebook. If you're interested in attending other upcoming webinar events, supporting IWP, or applying to one of our graduate programs, please go to iwp.edu. Again, that's iwp.edu. Thank you. Thank you very much.